We are live. Happy Friday, everyone that's tuning in live. JT here. Welcome to the huddle. The huddle is where I sit down with successful people from the world of sport and coaching. And it's all about learning more about their journey to greatness. Why? Because success always leaves clues. So first and foremost, again, happy Friday. If you're watching this live, if you are catching the replay, then that's great too. Happy whatever day that is. I am really enthused for my guest today. I have titled our conversation, The Power of Awareness. Again, great book I'm reading, but was really inspired because my guest today is someone I've known for a while, but he really inspires me by the work he's doing. It, it, when I think of him, I think about leadership. I think about innovation. I think about growth, evolving and making things better. And I'm really enthused to share his story with you. So my guest into the huddle today is Dr. Jeff Brooks. How are you, Jeff? Hello, hello. Thanks for having me, GT. I am yeah. well. Happy Friday to you too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Uh, for those that don't know, Jeff and I go back, right? We were actually reminiscing just before we hopped on here, just to think that, you know, we've known each other for a little bit. I had the pleasure of coaching Jeff when he was part of our junior football team at Central. And I know a lot of our former, co a lot of your former coaches were really enthused about seeing you come on here and, you know, just seemed everyone had all these great memories about you. So, yeah, so, so we've known each other for a while. You're doing some amazing work in the you know wellness space around concussions and and everything so yeah really again just really ex excited to dive right in now before we dive in just to give you an idea of of jeff and and what his sorry dr brooks and, and what he does is he is the director of operations for the concussion legacy foundation and he is doing a lot of great work, bringing more awareness and innovating this beautiful game that I love, that he loves, that many of you love, right? And concussions just aren't something that, you know, is a football thing anymore. I think we've all been become very aware of, you know, concussions are, are very, uh, the awareness is changing, right? And, and the education piece is there. So before we dive into that, Jeff, what I would really love to know is what role has sport played in your life and on your journey to greatness? Uh, I would say it's been paramount. Uh, sport, you know, from a young age as a kid, I was started in soccer and, you know, it's how you become so, or what kind of learn to become social, at least for me it was. I uh, met a lot of friends there um, and throughout my sport career, I've, you know, my teammates have become friends, uh, become great friends. You know, I've, I've got uh, teammates from years ago who are part of my wedding, my upcoming wedding. So that kind of that just shows the, the bonds that have formed. And uh, but aside from the social aspect, you learn so many great qualities, uh, you know, responsibility, accountability, uh, teamwork, um, both how to lead, but also how to follow, uh, depending on your role within the team. Uh, you learn, you know, critical thinking, how to analyze on the run, but also analyze things ahead of time. You know, the hours spent in film uh, prepping for upcoming teams and, and learning how to prepare yourself and how to prepare your teammates. Um, you learn how to deal with people, different types of people. Um, some people are good at one aspect and some are good at other aspects and learning that kind of give and take acknowledging when someone else is maybe better suited for a problem or a role and being able to step back for the betterment of the team um, just so much uh, so all those types of things i've learned from sport and it's actually uh you know as a young kid you always aspire to be the 
the professional athlete, um, but I'm excited to say that I'm still able to keep sports as a part of my career um, as a researcher and then also from the education and awareness side and the nonprofit side of things. So it's, uh, it's part of my everyday life, you know, my healthy, active living and um, yeah, I just can't say enough about sports. <laughs> It was amazing just to hear all these things that you ga gathered from sport. But what I really heard from all that was, I really felt like this deep sense of curiosity that you have, like this, this willingness to ask questions and to seek uh, you know, well, different questions and to seek, you know, why, why is this working? Has, has that always been something like, that, that deep curiosity to learn new things, is that something that's always been a part of you? Uh, yeah, I'd say so. I've forever been a student, um, both in the school sense of things, but I'd say a student of whatever sport it is I am interested in. Um, I am a firm believer that, you know, you can never really be a master of everything or of something, you can always keep learning. Uh, so, but to do that, it's, it's a bit of self-motivation. You want to be able to, you know, understand that you're not the best at something. And in order to be better, you have to ask questions and figure out why and recognize your own weaknesses um, and how you can work on them to improve upon them. That definitely speaks volumes about how humble you are. And as you were sharing that, it was interesting that you have this, this great balance of you have this ambition and drive, right? Like I've, I've coached you, I've, I've watched you at the high school level, I've watched you play at the university level, and you do have this ambition, this drive, right? To, to, to get better on a daily basis. But you also have this open-mindedness that you're very coachable. Now, is this something that you've always had is this something that you've had to work on or or was there there's someone that even taught you this uh i'd say it's a bit of all all of that um certainly you know as a young kid uh growing up it was instilled by my parents that you know you listen you listen to your coach he coaches the respectful leader the adult what they say goes uh but actually i guess almost fortunately early on in my soccer career um I had a coach who wasn't that great, uh, or at least I shouldn't say wasn't great. Uh, I didn't receive him well. He was a very much a um, just a firm kind of dictator, which I struggled with. But it was a great learning experience because I kind of knew from that how to uh, adapt to that type of coaching style. Um, but also, it was my first kind of <clears throat> realization that not everything a coach says may be exactly right, that coaches can be wrong too, just as players can be. And um, it kind of opened my eyes there that uh, I sometimes have to mold myself or change my ways. Uh, if, you know, a coach says something and it's uh, in, you know, that lo the long run, the coach, what coach says goes and it's for the betterment of the team. Um, but, you know, I might take a little pocket of information and realize later, okay, this is how, this situation adapted. Maybe if I try this, I might learn something from it later. And um, I was able to uh, change things later on. Um, so that was definitely eye opening. Um, and then just realizing that <clears throat> there's some things you can't control or can't change, but uh, how you react to things um, is certainly uh, something you can control. So I think that's what makes that's what helps me be uh, very coachable is, you know, I listen, I try not to uh, react, but I'd rather listen, process, and then um, adapt accordingly. So I think that's certainly what's helped me. <clears throat> oh, that's <laughs> so great. And there are a couple of words there, folks. And I, and I really want you to like, listen, like actively listen to what Jeff is talking about is he talked that he used words like learning, right? Like regardless of what the situation is, that ability to learn and take something from it. And you also use adaptability, like, you know, being able to sort of navigate and, and sometimes that means changing course, right? So uh, again, that, that just speaks volumes about 
how coachable you are, right? Learn, adapt, and just the words you're using. So after high school, again, and you had an amazing high school career, right? You went on to Western, right, to play. So what was that experience like transitioning from, you know, a star high school athlete going to play to that next level? Like, what did that experience, you know, how did it prepare you for what you're doing now? Uh, the first um, word that comes to mind, and probably because we just talked about it, would be humbling. Because um, as you say, you go from, uh, you know, I played both ways, uh, did as much as I could for the team um, in high school, and then you hit university and, you know, you're not a, you're not a fleck in someone's eye, really, you know, you're, <laughs> you're just a rookie, um, you know, you're uh, trying to earn a spot on the team, um, just trying to gain some respect from teammates, but, uh, which is, I mean, that's kind of the nature of sport and I had been in that role before. It just had not been to that degree. Um, certainly, you know, you go from, especially at Central, where I think we might have had 50 players on the team uh, to now over 100 at Western. Over 100 on the team, I think when, you know, you go in a training camp, there's like 140. So, you know, there's that uh, aspect of um, from a team side of things, then you're going from you know, top dog in high school with the, as the social circles and uh, from a school perspective to uh, what, like 20 times larger school with students and from all over. So it was um, a lot to take in, but it was so great. I would not want to change anything about it. Um, certainly uh, I was, it was humbling too, I guess, from the sense that you know, I didn't play till my third year. So for two years, I was uh, practice squad, you know, learning, uh, learning the plays and also just helping my, my other teammates prep for the games. And um, it certainly had its ups and downs emotionally. You know, you sometimes you felt like you weren't a part of the team or you uh, weren't contributing. Um, but that's, I think, comes with experiences uh, when you come from playing and being a part of uh, the actual games to now being on a practice side of things, it was uh, a new role that I had to learn and adapt to. Uh, but then once I was able to play, like I got that opportunity and continued playing, um, it was even more eye opening to how important my role in my first couple of years was because, you know, uh, prepping and learning about the other team's um, playing styles. Uh, could not happen without having uh, guys take on those roles and, and um, practice them out. So uh, it was a, you know, looking back now, it was a great experience overall. Um, but sometimes definitely when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to step back and, and see it from that kind of bird's eye view. Um, but yeah, I was, it's still certainly on, in my top favorite memories of just overall life is uh, playing football at Western. <laughs> nice. What I heard from you was preparation, right? It's it's putting in the reps and sets today in preparation of a greater tomorrow, right? And, you know, it was interesting hearing your story was so similar to what so many other high performers have shared in the huddle is that, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, it, it is a bit of a, you know, a hit to the ego sometimes because you're putting in all this work and you're like, when is it going to get there? But having that persistence to continue to, to do what most people aren't willing to do speaks volumes about your, you know, commitment to your goal, but also just that patience and persistence that you have brother. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I'd say too, you know, I was learning about, uh, I learned a lot more about myself too. I would um, sometimes feel like I wasn't, advancing anywhere from a football perspective like as a player so I would uh, hit the gym that much harder um, and put my a lot of my frustrations but also my um, willingness to motivate myself and advance and better myself in the gym and I certainly saw improvements there you know I was if I couldn't be the 
best player on the field, I'd strive to be the, um, you know, the hustle guy, the one who's going to work harder and motivate my teammates, you know, whether younger or older, challenge them um, from a gym perspective too. And that certainly became my mindset even after playing is that always, and even still now, um, you know, physical activity is such an important part, even, you know, during COVID, especially, I'd say uh, it's, it's an excuse to get outside or to, to move around. And uh, those, those types of lessons and that, um, I'd say, kind of strict routine has stuck with me all this time, too. It's really interesting to hear you talking about that call like what I'm really hearing for you is that culture right that leadership of you know you being a leader and I think back to one of your teammates Mackenzie who was on a few months ago and he it was interesting how similar I heard your experience and his and then so was that a culture that you guys had where it's just like no we like greatness excellence is the bar right and it doesn't matter what's going on like this is just the level which you prepare for. Is that, is that, was that part of the culture? On your uh, team? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, certainly it's, it's, you know, how can you better yourself every day? You know, if you're going to spend the time to do a hour and a half workout or to go to practice for two hours and watch film for two hours afterwards, it's a waste of time if you're not going to get something out of it. Um, so, you know, if it's in the gym, push yourself in that last set or, uh, you know, if it's on the field, you know, learn that, learn the play that you can't quite get down, whether it's so your teammates can learn from you because they're getting ready to play Guelph the next week or um, for yourself so you can be confident in when you see this in a real game, you know how to adapt and react to it. Um, or, you know, same thing watching film, uh, you know, don't just kind of sit there and drift off or be on your phone it's what can you learn from film so that next practice or game the next that week you're you're able to take from it and that time was spent wisely uh, with coming to university especially as a varsity athlete you learn very quickly that time is probably your most valuable um, asset and you have so little of it when you've got uh, five hours I'd say of football something football related today and then you still have all your classes and then you want to have try to have some sort of social life so you want to make sure you're gaining from each of those things <clears throat> okay I, I love that so after you're done your career as a student athlete you you transitioned into getting your master's and eventually your phd and to become a leader in the concussion education and awareness piece uh, space. So what was your drive to, you know, grow and evolve into this role and really become an innovator in the space? Uh, it began in my um, final year of undergrad. Uh, the, there was a former teammate of mine who had uh, started this project um, in his master's and it was putting accelerometers so small devices in all of uh, or most of the players helmets and it would monitor how many impacts the players had during the season where the impacts occurred how big they were um, and that kind of data that information and uh, at that time I was in my undergrad for physics so that was very interesting to me from a physics standpoint so from a school standpoint and um, also at that time, it was certainly wasn't new, but it was kind of just hitting the news about, um, you know, the concussion crisis in the NFL. And uh, certainly that was what was gaining the news. But I, I looked at it as more the sport of football in general. Um, people are worried about uh, playing the sport. <laughs> it was get, um, kind of under fire. Um, a few years later, you know, the movie Concussion by Will Smith, or with Will Smith came out. So certainly it was a hot topic and I was just chatting with uh, Cody Campbell. Um, his name is, uh, he has gone on to achieve his PhD in North Carolina. He's doing great research as well. And uh, so I was just chatting with him uh, kind of after practices about the experience he's had with it. And it became uh, very 
great interest of mine. And uh, as he was moving on to North Carolina for his PhD, the opportunity opened up for me to take over the project, which I was happy to accept. And it was a way to still stay involved with not just the sport of football, but the Western Mustangs football team um, and feel like I am contributing to a sport that has given me so much. Uh, so that was kind of my motivation was rather than try to abolish the sport and claim how it's horrible um, and so bad for the brain, but instead think of it as what can we do to minimize it? Because there are so many good things you learn from sports and the sport of football that we talked about earlier that um, I wanted to find a less drastic solution or try to help find one. And that was certainly my motivation. And I love what you just shared that last little bit was what you did is you chose, like the easy thing to do would be to focus on the problem, right? And, and I feel like we do live in a world where it's so easy to get focused on the problem, what's not working well, what, you know, and to go there. But just hearing your like, hey, you know, I want to create some solutions. I want to find out how can we grow and evolve this beautiful game that has given me so much, but then make it so that we can play it and, and grow and evolve, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, as I said, you're an innovator, right? So you're, you're pushing the envelope. And, you know, from my background, you know, coaching for 20 years, even I think of how the game has evolved you know, not only from when I played many years ago, but even when I was coaching you or even in the last five years, how it's changed. What have you noticed as you push the envelope to really growing the game and, and evolving how it's played and making more of an emphasis on, on player safety? Like uh, certainly, I'd say uh, just from when I started like at Western or even in high school, you know, practice was, uh, there was a lot more focus on still hitting, you know, it was making sure you can tackle, you tackle hard. Um, you're, you know, you're going through the player. Um, and that was uh, certainly a focus I'd say up till second or third year of university with uh, two a days and lots of hitting to then tailing that back. Um, so from, like a coach's perspective, it's uh, more about, yes, we can hit and tackle properly, but let's not hurt our own players. You know, let's, we can ensure that we do it properly and have the right technique, and then we'll save it for the, the opponents on the field, and then we'll scale it back again throughout the week. Um, so that was great to see uh, that, uh, you know, players aren't taking unnecessary hits um, from my research, from lots of research that's been out there. It's about 70% of player or 70% of Im head impacts that players receive occur during practices. So those types of numbers are for the mo most part unnecessary. I'd say uh, you don't need to necessarily be running Okies on a Friday when you got game on Saturday. Right. So that uh, mindset from coaches uh, was changed, which was great. And then from a player standpoint, um, this occurred, I'd say more during, uh, after I played, but in my research collecting days was, you know, the first couple of years I get players coming off the field, like, yeah, yeah, Brooksy, like, I just got a huge hit. You got to show me the numbers of that one. It's going to be, it's going to be off the charts to then coming off the field and being like, yeah. So I think I took a bit of a hit there. Um, not, you know, I'm not sure I'm feeling so well, so I might try to sit you know, the next drive off or something like that, or I'm going to go talk to the trainer. So it was that player's shift of, instead of, I want to take a bunch or give a bunch of huge hits. It was being mindful of, you know, if I did take a big hit or I gave one and I'm not feeling good, maybe I need to step back a bit. And uh, um, that was really uh, encouraging to see from players that they're mindful of their own selves rather than I know when I played, you know, it was that kind of invincibility mindset that you'd lead with your head, you had a helmet on, so your head couldn't be hurt. But uh, knowing now that, you know, helmets were really made to prevent skull fracture uh, way back when, so they don't actually prevent concussions. They cushion your head a bit, but they're not gonna slow the, or they're not going to stop your brain from kind of shaking in its skull, so to speak. So that's, uh, those have been two great things I've seen from 
two levels, you know, the player level and the coaching level. So what I'm hearing from you is like that there's been a culture change, right? With how coaches go practice. Like it's not just, you know, hitting, smashing, smashing all the time and players sort of understanding <laughs> that, you know, that, that this invincibility is, it's not about that anymore. Right. It's about, okay. So one of the questions that just came up for me is I actually don't spend a lot of time watching the NFL or NCAA anymore. I know people sometimes assume that that's all I do, but <laughs> So I'm curious, like a lot of rule changes have happened with the game, right? In terms of, you know, making you know, targeting rules, right? In terms of leading with the head, taking certain, like the kickoff. Have these rule changes, like, are they necessary? Are they working? Is adapting this like kind of just, this is how to keep the game moving forward? Uh, I'd say they're working. Um, it's, it's hard because it's slow and steady, right? You, you institute a change, a rule change, and you've got to have it last for at least a season just to compare it to the previous season. Um, so in that sense, you only really have an opportunity once a year to do so. Um, but things like uh, changing the kickoffs, you know, from uh, being able to have like a two or three person wedge and then kickoff guys would come down the field and just fly at the wedge and sacrifice their bodies. You know, that's certainly one um, kind of glaring change that's come, that comes to mind. Um, then, and then, yeah, keeping players safe, like you know, uh, the safety comes across the middle and just targets the receiver, you know, goes for their head to take them out. So to see that players are getting penalized for that, you can kind of see a lot more action on the ball. Um, so you're, you're going for the pick or the the knockdown rather than trying to take out the the receiver and i think that's very um exciting too uh from a fan standpoint is certainly a big hit could fire you up but a lot of the reaction now is i think just because people are thinking you know these are these are people too um having been a f football player in university when i watch college players now and i see someone get hurt it's like oh no this this is a young kid still who's been hurt. It's not um, a pro athlete. So to see that the play is moving towards plays on the ball where you've got opportunity for exciting, you know, great catches or just athletic athleticism that kind of at its finest rather than brute force. I think that's some um, promising and great culture change to see uh, from rules. And then to see it kind of trickle down like uh, um, limits on hitting um, I know in the NCAA, especially there's, uh, and, and the NFL, um, that there's, you know, only so many practices you can have during the season that involve hitting. Uh, so there's a lot more focus on if you're going to do some sort of technique drills, it's on pads, like ta uh, tackle dummies and stuff rather than person on person, or you remove the helmet entirely so that players are learning to keep their helmet or their head out of the hit necessarily and more lead with the shoulder. So those types of techniques. Um, which is great to see. Um, there's been some rules that are kind of right on edge, which I think are interesting. I know in the NFL, they proposed a onside kick or removal of the onside kick and instead going towards basically like a fourth and 15 format. So if, you know, you score, but you're still down by a few points and instead of running an onside kick, you get the ball on like a fourth and 15 where you would normally kick it from. And if you convert successfully, you'd keep the ball and keep going down the field and continue your drive. Whereas if the other team stops it, it's a turnover similar to like an onside kick, but you don't have tw uh, 24 players or 22 in the U S running at each other and just smashing heads and, you know, one guy on the ball and all getting piled on. So from a player safety uh, standpoint, again, it seems much safer. So that's, a rule I've been watching for the past few years that I think the past two years they've um, said they try it out in the Pro Bowl, but then no one ever does an onside kick in the Pro Bowl anyway. Uh, but I'm that's one I'm hoping really comes out. I think that would uh, certainly be a lot safer too. Yeah, no, it's um, it's really interesting, right? Just hearing your perspective as as an expert, right, in concussion education, concussion research, concussion awareness and I, 
I was sharing this with you before we hopped on that one of the big changes for me, right? And and it's one of those things, folks, like, you know, as as this world changes, right, we become more aware, right? It's like you think of even simple things like smoking, like like women used to smoke in the hospitals after they would give birth, like, you know, things just change. But I remember a big shift in the way I looked at concussions and, and how I was showing up as a coach was once I had kids. And I remember my last few years, I like we, we at Lucas did not do onside kicks because I always thought, what if that's my son standing under there, like a, like a sitting duck, and I remember just that starting to look at things in terms of what would I do if that was one of my loved ones really changed my, the actions I was taking and made me so much more aware of, you know, player, player safety. Hey, I, I love to coach. I coach hard. I, I love to, I love to win, but there, there's a point. It's not, you know, win at all costs. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I'm curious you're really pushing the envelope here and you are challenging old ways of thinking of the way the game has to be put, like the way coaches coach, the way players play. Has there been some resistance as you're bringing these new ideas, as you are pushing for changes? Like, have you been facing any resistance? Uh, yeah, I've seen some, um, certainly I wouldn't like at Western, it's been great. Uh, coach Marshall and coaching staff has, um, always worked, uh, with like, you know, coaches always asking about my research and kind of things we're finding and he's adapted uh, accordingly. So I wouldn't say there, um, I'd say like, uh, you know, just over the time playing and, uh, while collecting, um, data, I saw changes, you know, like I said, there were two days practices to then maybe, you'd have like a morning hitting practice and afternoon was like just shoulders uh, or just helmets so that um, players were kind of taking it easy. And then a lot more emphasis on hitting uh, or tackling drills that were on dummies and, and pads rather than players. So, um, but where I have seen resistance is actually at the younger ages. Um, so coaches who are coaching young kids and there's a fine line between uh, teaching kids and making sure they're running through the drills and they know how to hit properly so that when they get to a game, they can do so like tackle, um, without putting themselves at risk. But then also, you know, you don't need to be running the extreme hitting drills every single day leading up to the game, but they certainly, you know, there's the idea that they should be hitting maybe a little more than what you do in university, because at that point, hopefully you would know how to hit by them. Um, so one project that I've worked, uh, that I worked on with Concussion Legacy is we moved, we went down to the States to uh, a New York, New Jersey kind of private high school league. And we worked with, or we gathered uh, information from all the coaching staff, administrative staff on the rules that they currently have and where they'd like to see possible changes being made. So we collected all of that information, assembled it and gave them recommendations on what rules they could change. So we suggested things like changing the kickoff, um, adapting the punt to more Canadian style punting where um, you have to give the player five yards rather than uh, a player who doesn't call for a fair catch, they just get teed off on. Um, and then another big one was hitting limits during uh, preseason as well as during the regular season. And uh, they, they were, uh, they voted to change some of the rules, not others. Um, we actually sat in on one of the first meetings and it was very interesting to, because before we were collecting all the data over um, like telephone interviews and that, but to see them in person and that kind of, um, some of them still had the old school way of thinking and it was like, it was their way was the only way. It wasn't, uh, well, we'll think of it. It's no, we need to constantly be hitting. I want to have two hours of um, hitting a week or, you know, one hour in every practice rather than 20 minutes for the entire week. Uh, so seeing um, that mindset and the fact that, you know, that was one small league, I think there were eight or nine teams in the league and that's a small portion of the U S right. And the U S certainly is much larger than it is in Canada. So it's unfortunate to think that there's still, 
that type of mindset throughout there. Um, and it's just going to take some time and you know, kind of hope that cooler heads prevail. In that instance, some, uh, some of the rules or recommendations that we suggested were taken um, into account, some of them weren't, and that's okay. You know, that our job was just to recommend uh, what they wanted to try. Um, but unfortunately, that was right before COVID happened. So this, the upcoming season where those rules would have taken effect hasn't happened yet. Um, mm -hmm. So we're still waiting to see on that. Uh, but yeah, there's certainly some resistance to to uh, these types of coaching styles. I think it's it's more resistance from the coaching than it is than I've seen from players. Yeah, it's um, it's really interesting your observation because you know I'm constantly observing and it and it's it's I find it really interesting why. Well, you know, I'm always asking not why from a place of judgment, but why are we, why be so resistant to it? Right. Because at the end of the day, like I said, I, I always think of things in terms of if I was coaching my own kids, would I be doing that? And just that question has all <laughs> just being open to asking myself that question has made me such a more intuitive coach and such a, I, I feel like I've become so much better at being player driven as opposed to like me driven. Yeah, I think so the well, I've been very for, fortunate. I think all my pretty much all the coaching staff or coaches I've had through my football career have had that same kind of mindset. And I would certainly think uh, um, that as far as I know, most of them had kids of some varying age. So I think that certainly helped. Um, but I think to those who are resistant, it could be a um, this is how they grew up. This is how they were coached and they were successful that way. And mm -hmm. rather than thinking that there are more than one ways to the path, like to a successful path, if it worked for them, then it's going to work for their kid or whoever they're coaching and it's their way or the highway. And it's, I mean, it's not just in coaching, it's in all aspects of life. You see people who are, um, kind of that mindset and, there's not much you can do about it, unfortunately. Um, from there, you know, it comes down to, we've had some very interesting ethical conversations in Concussion Legacy Foundation because uh, of the idea that if you are putting your kid into football or into any type of contact sport, um, you know, the, a, a child isn't necessarily going to be able to make these decisions about themselves, about their own player safety, because they're a child, they don't, they don't know what they don't know. Um, so it's kind of on the parent at that point. So, you know, should a parent be talking to the coach if a coach is that, uh, has that mindset, should they take the player out at risk of kind of getting that label or, you know, you still can learn, you know, as I said, when I was a kid, I learned a lot from a coach who I wasn't a huge fan of, but I was still able to learn from them. But it's like that fine line between learning, but also then now you're putting your child's safety at risk. Um, and uh, so there's a, been a big push towards flag football uh, for younger children. And I get asked that a lot, what I would do if I had kids. And uh, the more and more I've looked at the data and kind of the idea behind it, I think I'm a fan of flag football up to a certain age, you know, 12 to 14, pretty much high school, I think. Um, because when I think back to when I played as a kid, I, it was fun. I loved playing tackle football, but I can think of like there were times when I was injured so many times when I, you just think of as a kid and you've, it's like wearing, you're wearing a fishbowl on your head, right? The helmets never really fit. The padding's never great. So I think you're putting yourselves at risk or the kids at risk at that point. And you can still play the game and have fun playing flag, uh, you know, learning aspects of the game plays, um, schemes, that kind of thing without putting your head at risk. And it gives you a chance to explore the game safely. So maybe by the time you hit high school, you realize, you know what, football's not for me. You don't have to, you can step away. You haven't put your head at risk for so many years. And then you can step into it if you really do like it in high, like starting in high school. And at that point, your body is developed a bit more. You're no longer you know, skinny kid with a big head or a skinny kid facing a really big kid, um, things even out a little bit. Um, so from that aspect, uh, 
I've been more of a uh, in favor of flag football, I think, from that. Mm. And it's really great that you share that. And folks, for, for those that don't know Jeff, I know anyone that has played with Jeff, anyone that's coached Jeff, like Jeff played hard. Like he was, <laughs> he was a big hitter. So, so it's really interesting that, you know, just hearing you, like just being open to different ways to introduce people to the game, right? Whether it's flag football, whether it's just, and, and different things like that. It's just, yes, we both love this game. Many of, many of the people that are going to watch this love the game, but just being open that there are different ways to do it. And it's, yeah, it, it, it's, um, what really came up for me was I thought of coach McKay, right? And one thing we used to talk about in, in kinesiology, we'd always have these, these conversations in that grade 12 class is the difference between early specialization versus late specialization, right? And, and what do you actually need to, to thrive in, let's say football, right? And there's lots of different ways. You were a high level soccer player, right? Before, before football. So I'm curious, with all your research with through the Concussion Legacy uh, Foundation and, and with Western and with these schools, what do we need to do? What is one thing that the game needs to do to, to grow and evolve in order to keep participation rates up, right? To grow the game, but then also keep people in involved in, in, in the game? Like, is there, is there one thing that needs to happen from a, from your research and education and awareness perspective? Um, it's hard to pinpoint it to one thing because you have so many, um, you have so many areas involved. Like, uh, you know, you've got players, you've got coaches, you've got more league administration, and then you've got fans, I would say are kind of how I would been maybe the four main categories. So, from that aspect, you know, I think awareness and education is key um, for player safety. So players knowing and getting them to understand about how important their head is, uh, that, you know, your, your brain, you only have one brain, you injure it. Um, it's not like this, it's not the same thing, like you can just get surgery on your knee or your shoulder and hopefully come back. Um, so having players aware of that uh, so that they can play mindfully. Um, kind of the same thing with coaches, but, you know, the focus on it's your players brains you're taking care of, not your own. Um, and so making sure that they're aware that of the ways that you can, uh, reduce exposing players, um, to unnecessary impacts, whether that's through changing up your practice, uh, your practice formatting, um, also how you're coaching, uh, like uh, tackling techniques and whatnot. Um, and then from league administration, it's what kind of policies can we make sure we have an effect so uh, that those coaches who may be more resistant to change, you know, have to follow it. You know, things like tackling time limits, um, penalizing uh, bad plays, that type of thing. And then from fans, it's uh, making, uh, helping them realize that Sure, there may not be as many huge hits where a guy gets decleated, but you're also now looking at probably a faster game where we've got players so focused on chasing the ball down and those types of big plays and appreciating, you know, a good defensive play is stopping the ball at the line of scrimmage. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, destroying the quarterback. Uh, it could be a defensive lineman making a great move on a lineman and running a quarterback down for a sack or it could be all the whole team works together and plugs up the holes and the running back has nowhere to go um or same thing on offense it's three or you know 11 great blocks and player goes through right and appreciating that that is good football and uh or you know the one-handed catch was which is awesome but maybe that one-handed catch is by a db because they're making play on the ball rather than uh playing um, for the player. And I mean, I give a lot of defensive uh, um, examples, having been a very much a defensive player myself, but I, yeah. I can appreciate it the other way too. I just think I'm more excited about defensive plays. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, it's what I really heard from you and it seemed to be all theme is, is making this game like 
player centered, right? Like let's keep the players thriving, performing at their best, you know, so that we can just marvel at seeing what the human body and what, what a human can do, right? What a great athlete can do. So, so that's what I really got from it is let's make the game about, you know, player, player centered. That's how we grow. And that's how we grow the game. That's how we innovate. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, you know, I'd say, especially in the U S and it's obviously it's a business and lots of money is made off the sport of football. Um, but you see aspects like the whole kind con- of, I guess, ethical dilemma around t- uh, players, universities making money off of their players who aren't getting paid. And I think back to not necessarily saying the players should get paid, but you think of how many hours a player puts in in university when they are supposed to be a student athlete. And I think certainly at Western student part was put first. From what I hear, I can't actually speak to it in the U.S. It seems like the athlete side uh, kind of gets put first a lot more, and uh, you know, appreciating that players are in school to hopefully achieve a degree and move on from life. You know, it's like one percent goes on to professional sports; the other ninety-nine percent are taking what they've learned from the sport and applying it to their next job, career, whatever the next endeavor is. So making sure that um, those players, as you said, it's player centered, they still can get something out of football and they're not run into the ground or they come out of it with substance abuse problems or brain damage that, you know, 10 years, 15 years later, they're uh, having memory problems, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I love it. I, I love what you're saying. Like. Yeah, just where the focus is. So the last question I would love to ask you, Jeff, is this. What, you know, we're, we're in an interesting time to say the least, right? We, we were talking beforehand how, you know, it's been an interesting time in the world the last year. What is one piece of advice that you could give for someone that's going through maybe a challenging time? You know, they, maybe their health is in disarray because they can't get to the gym, their relationship breakdown financially, you know, things just aren't going well. They've lost their job. Like what is just one thing that they can do today to get the ball rolling, to start creating some positive momentum and to start, you know, just creating some success again. Um, I'd say if, for me, if I'm going through a tough time, it's, uh, kind of just stepping back and realizing that so yes you're going through a tough time and that is natural that will happen um i would hardly say anyone could say they've had a perfect always positive um times throughout their whole life Uh, so kind of realizing that what you're in is just a stage and um, it can change uh and part of that uh, can be in your control part of it cannot be so trying to focus on the parts that can be in your control whether that's shifting your mindset whether it's you know going out for a walk getting fresh air whatever whatever activity whether it's physical or playing a game whatever it is that you need to do to help clear your mind or kind of reset um, and then take it, you know, one step at a time is, okay, I've done that. What's the next little thing I can do? And those are the little things you can control. And you'll start to notice that everything else will hopefully fall into place one at one time or another. Love it. One play at a time, right? Just keep the ball, right? (laughs) Or in your case, one defensive stop at a time, right? Just stop the offense once at a time and then make them get the ball. It was easy. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Jeff, First and foremost, I wanted to thank you for coming on. I wanted to acknowledge you, Jeff, for choosing to be someone who demonstrates growth, that values growth, that is a leader, that is choosing to innovate and challenge old ways of thinking and to really create a shift, a culture change in this beautiful game that we both love. I I know it's not easy at times changing old ways of thinking, but I just wanted to thank you for being a leader and an innovator in the space. So thank you, brother. Well, thank you for having me. I uh, certainly can say I learned a lot from 
my coaching staff back in the days at Central, and uh, it was it was a pleasure. I'm happy to come on and you know have these types of chats with you. It's uh, it's growth in itself, just being able to reflect back and us. Uh, you know, sometimes you forget about things and um, calling on you know hearing the, the aspects that you remember, your memories of my early days. Yeah. Um, is is fun to hear about because I've forgotten that kind of side of things. So it's it's enriching and uh, um, takes me back. So I appreciate that. Yeah, no worries. So, so last thing, how can the thinking into greatness community, how can I help or be of service to you? How, like, is there a way we can follow what you're up to? Uh, certainly. Uh, for, so for Concussion Legacy Foundation Canada, we have our own, you know, our Instagram page, our social media. Um, there's also a Concussion Legacy Foundation in the U.S. where partner organizations um so following on social media of any standpoint or of any mm -hmm. point sorry facebook twitter instagram you can see what's what we're up to um what projects we have uh going on what's what's coming up um you can interact with us in that sense uh in this technical um day and age i think social media is a great thing as well as a challenging thing um but from <laughs> our standpoint getting information out there, it's a great way to do it. And it seems to be the most effective way of doing it. Um, so we try to vet, obviously, the information we're putting out there. And we're confident that it's uh, correct. It's research based. So certainly, if there's things you're interested in there, uh, I would encourage you to follow any of those types of those social media accounts to, to see what we're up to. Okay, well, I will definitely share it in the description and, and share that Instagram handle. And yeah, so thank you everyone for tuning into the huddle today. I hope that this conversation at the very least will get you to think differently, right? And, and you know what, if you take anything from, from Jeff and what I really took from this conversation was curiosity is a superpower that the only way to change your current results is you have to to change the questions you're asking, right? And that when you open up your mind and start asking some different questions and start challenging some of those old ideas, that's how you grow. That's how you innovate. That's how you adapt. And that is what the beauty of life is, right? We are designed to grow. That's part of our DNA. So choose to grow, evolve, adapt, innovate. Greatness will be the byproduct. Have an amazing rest of your day and we'll chat next week.